very much for the introduction, Nuno, and thank you again to Ian for inviting me to give the Stimson Lectures. It's truly a pleasure to be here, and uh, it's also an honor to deliver these lectures at an august institution like Yale. Uh, I also, uh, as a good Marxist in the Groucho Marx sense of the term, am <laughs> deeply humbled that so many people turned out to hear me talk that we had to change the venue, so thank you very much. Uh, I hope I can deliver a lecture that makes it all worth it. Uh, as Nuno said, tonight I'm going to talk about the false promise of liberal hegemony. For those of you who were here on Monday night, you know that what I did was I really talked about liberalism uh, and didn't say much about foreign policy. This is the first of my two talks uh, tonight and tomorrow night that really do with the international dimension of liberalism. The first uh, talk was all about just sort of getting at the essence of liberalism. Uh, the outline for tonight is that I'd like to start by defining what I mean by liberal hegemony and explain to you why states pursue it. Then I'd like to explain when states pursue liberal hegemony. So the first part will deal with the why, the second part is when. And then in the third part, I want to talk about what it looks like in practice, and then finally explain to you why it is prone to fail disastrously. So the first part of the talk is on the subject of what is liberal hegemony. Uh, just a few words about its policy relevance. Then what I really want to do is talk about its theoretical underpinnings. With regard to its policy relevance, I think almost everybody who studies IR in my world agrees that it has been the foreign policy of the United States since the Cold War ended, that the United States has pursued liberal hegemony. Uh, and for those who have any doubts, the argument usually goes that it wasn't really true up until 2001, but clearly it was true after 2001. But most people agree that during the entire Cold War period, it has been uh, the foreign policy of choice. And moreover, it's a f foreign policy that the American elite loves. Uh, as I said the other night, we sometimes refer to the American foreign policy establishment as the blob. This is Ben Rhodes' terminology, Ben Rhodes who worked for Barack Obama. Uh, the blob is deeply wedded to liberal hegemony and it includes both Republicans and Democrats. There's this myth in the land mainly pervaded by Republicans that Republicans and Democrats have very different views on foreign policy. This is poppycock, it's Tweedledee and Tweedledum, right? And they love their, uh, they love their liberal hegemony. Donald Trump is an exception. He ran against liberal hegemony. And where he ends up remains to be seen. But uh, he ran against it. Now, a little bit about the analytical foundation of liberal hegemony. And this grows out of my discussion from last time. As I said to you, liberalism is at its root a political philosophy that focuses on the individual and places enormous emphasis on inalienable rights. Inalienable meaning they apply to everybody and they cannot be taken away. And the point I made last time and I'd like to emphasize again tonight is when you marry that sense of individualism with inalienable rights, you get a universalist ideology. And the point I made last time and make again here is that, you, is that liberal hegemony or even liberalism when it applies to foreign policy has this universalist dimension that is of great importance. And what it means in terms of a broad foreign policy goal is that you quickly become consumed with spreading liberal democracy across the globe. That emphasis on inalienable rights, which leads to universalism, produces a foreign policy that emphasizes the spreading of liberal democracy. And there are three reasons for that. 
really gets to the heart and soul of the argument, and I'll unpack them all, but just put them up in laundry list fashion right now. You want to spread democracy for three reasons. One, to protect human rights across the world. Two, to cause international peace. And three, to protect liberalism at home. And again, all of this grows out of the emphasis on individualism and inalienable rights, as I'll make clear as we go along here. So let me start by talking about protecting human rights across the world. The basic argument is that people who live in a far off country are no different than people who live in your country. Borders actually don't matter very much. Rights are of great importance and everybody has rights. And when the rights of non-Americans are being threatened, Americans have a responsibility to do everything they can to protect those people whose rights are being violated. And of course, the most important here, important right here is the right to life. If some foreign dictator is murdering large numbers of his or her people, the United States has a responsibility that grows out of this universalism to protect the rights of those individuals that are being violated. Now, this goes so far in the liberal discourse that you end up getting the argument that non-liberal governments are in a state of aggression with their own people. Just think about that statement. This is Michael Doyle, mainstream, prominent, liberal international relations theorist at Columbia University. He's basically saying non-liberal governments, no matter what they do, non-liberal governments are in a state of aggression with their own people. What happens here is that you go from a situation where you can use your military forces to intervene in different countries when there are gross violations of individual rights and fix the problem and then leave. You, you go from that more modest policy to one where you decide that the best way to protect rights is simply to turn another country into a liberal democracy. Because once it's a liberal democracy, the individual rights, which are privileged in liberalism, are protected by definition. So if you have a planet that is filled with nothing but liberal democracies, the problem of gross violations of human rights is simply taken off the table. If you merely just act like a fire department and you only intervene in those situations where you see rights being violated, you fix it and then you get out, you don't ultimately solve the problem. So what this emphasis on protecting rights does especially when it's taken in the form that Michael Doyle lays out, it leads to the belief that what you want to do is populate the planet with liberal democracies. Second reason to spread liberal democracy, it leads to international peace. <laughs> Virtually everybody in this audience, I'm sure, knows all about democratic peace theory. Democratic peace theory is based on the basic liberal template involving rights and tolerance, right? It's the whole idea that people across the planet have a set of inalienable rights and that they tend to respect the rights of other individuals, right? And that leads to international peace, right? if you can spread democracy across the planet. In other words, if you create a world of all democracies, they're not going to fight against each other because people respect the rights of people in other countries and they're tolerant. The tolerance grows out of that emphasis on inalienable rights, as I talked about last time. 
This is basic democratic peace theory, and this is the basic liberal logic that underpins it. Right? Moreover, it solves the twin problems of nuclear proliferation and terrorism. Right? If you have peace, you don't need nuclear weapons. There's no need for, global, for, for nuclear weapons in a world where there's nothing but liberal democracies. And terrorism is certainly not going to be a problem because in the liberal story, liberal states never engage in terrorism. It's always non-liberal states. So the idea is to create a world where they're just liberal democracies. And this is the rationale for invading Iraq. Sometimes people will say to me, John, how can you say that invading Iraq uh, was based on a liberal theory. Well, the invasion of Iraq and the Bush doctrine more generally, as I'll make clear as we go along here, was based on the assumption that if you could go into Iraq, go into Iran, go into Syria, you could turn the greater Middle East into a sea of democracies. You could turn them into a sea of democracies, cause peace, there would be no nuclear proliferation and there would be no terrorism. That's what they thought would be the end result. This is why the Bush administration thought that Al-Qaeda itself was not the problem. Al-Qaeda was part of the problem, but rogue states in the Middle East, rogue states meaning non-democracies that don't dance to America's tune, have to be turned into liberal democracies. So once that happens, then you turn the Middle East into a zone of peace. And oh, by the way, this is exactly what happened in Europe, according to the liberal story. Why do we have peace in Europe? because it's filled with liberal democracies. And I'll talk more about this in the context of NATO expansion. They don't fight each other. You don't get terrorism. You don't get nuclear proliferation. Third, oh, let me, yeah, just on the business of international peace. Uh, what you also see uh, in the literature on uh, liberal democracy as a cause of peace is a tremendous emphasis on the word community, especially international community. You surely have all heard the word international community many times. International community is very much a liberal term. Think about the opposite of international. It's national. When the journal, journal International Security was created, there was a huge debate about whether to call it national security or international security. And they called the international security, right? International, right? And it's the international community giving you the sense that there are really no meaningful borders among the states that exist in that community. Those borders are very porous. We talk about the transatlantic community. We talk about the European community, the EC. We went from the European steel and coal community to the European community to the European Union, right? But the European community, we talk about security communities. Carl Deutsch's famous term. Woodrow Wilson used to talk about communities of power, right? And of course, in these communities, you're not going to have any war. That's the basic argument. Third reason to spread liberal democracy uh, is to protect liberalism at home. Uh, the fact is that virtually every liberal theorist understands that you're not going to convince every single person in a liberal society that liberalism is the ideal political system. And there's always a danger on the home front that uh, uh, there'll be a group that is powerful and will attempt to overthrow the liberal order. And what really scares liberals is the thought that that group on the home front will form an alliance with a foreign country. And that foreign country will help fuel revolution at home. Okay? So if you live in a world of all liberal democracies, that problem is taken off the table. That's reflected in Woodrow Wilson's famous words. He went before Congress on April 2nd, 1917, to ask for a declaration of war against Germany. And that's where he made his famous remarks that his aim was to help create a world that could be made safe for democracy. A world that could be made safe for democracy. Because he understood that liberal democracy sometimes exists in a tenuous state. 
Just to give you two other examples of this. The United States and the Red Scares after both World War I and during the early Cold War. What was the basic fear here? The basic fear was that there were communists in the United States and those communists would lie with the communist state like the Soviet Union and the end result of that would be trouble, if not revolution, on the home front. So if you can create a situation where you turn the Soviet Union into a liberal democracy, you turn communist China into a liberal democracy, you just take that problem right off the table. And think about the problem today from China and Russia's point of view. What China and Russia today fear is that liberal groups and individuals inside those countries who are unhappy with the likes of Vladimir Putin will ally with the United States to undermine the regime. You go to Moscow today, you go to Beijing today, they are really worried about regime change. Hard as that may, to be believe, that may be to believe, regime change instigated by the United States in an alliance with liberal forces inside their own countries. And again, if the United States was not a liberal country, this problem would be taken off the table. So the underpinnings of liberal hegemony, emphasis on individualism plus inalienable rights gives it a powerful universalist impulse. And that impulse leads to a foreign policy committed to spreading liberal democracy around the world for those three reasons. When do states pursue liberal hegemony? This is the second big question. My argument is it depends largely on the structure of the system. It depends largely on whether or not the system is bipolar, multipolar, or unipolar. Uh, if it's bipolar or multipolar, in other words, there are, if there are two or more great powers in the system, states cannot pursue liberal hegemony. They have to act according to balance of power logic. And in a minute, I'm going to explain to you why that is completely consistent with liberal theory. But just for now, understand that my argument is when there are two or more great powers, each of those great powers has to worry about the other great power and therefore has to worry about the balance of power and has to act according to balance of power logic. In a unipolar system where there is a single great power, a single great power, this is the United States, of course, when the Cold War ends, you can pursue liberal hegemony because you don't have to worry about the balance of power because there is effectively no balance of power. You are Godzilla and you are free to do pretty much what you want. And, and you understand what's happening here. If you're Godzilla and you have this liberal impulse hardwired into you, you know what you're going to do. You're going to try and create democracy all over the world. I'll say more about that in a second. But unipolarity is where you get liberal hegemony. And as I said, this is consistent with the liberal formula for dealing with conflict. Remember what I said last time, liberalism at its root is a theory of conflict. Liberals assume that you have individuals and those individuals cannot agree on first principles in all cases. And sometimes the disagreement over first principles is so powerful that people want to kill each other. And that is why you need the night watchman state. There's no liberal theorist who says you don't need a state. The three-part solution or formula for preventing conflict is number one, inalienable rights. If everybody has rights and everybody has the right to life, not going to be a lot of killing if you can convince people of that. Furthermore, there's going to be a lot of tolerance. So purveying the norm of tolerance is very important in the liberal story. But all liberals understand that emphasizing rights and emphasizing tolerance, those two things together, is not enough. You need a night watchman state. Think about the state of nature. 
liberals start in the state of nature, where individuals are constantly in a situation where there's potential for conflict and death. And what they do is they form a social contract, and the social contract involves a higher authority. So you need that higher authority. There's no higher authority in international politics. There is no world state. There's no social contract, despite all this talk about community. Therefore, if you're surrounded by other great powers, you have no choice but to compete with them, according to liberal logic. Because according to liberal logic, without the night watchman state, you are back in the state of nature. The state of nature is anarchic. It's not hierarchic. The reason you form a state, a social contract, is to get out of anarchy. But you don't have that in international politics. And for that reason, when there are other great powers in the system, you have to compete with them, and you can't pursue liberal hegemony. But if you're in unipolarity, the imbalance is so great between Godzilla and all of the minions that Godzilla is free to pursue liberal hegemony. That's the basic argument. They take this one step further. Bruno Montero, as you know, has written the seminal book on unipolarity. And he says in that book that the unipole has three options. If you think about it, these make perfect sense. First of all, the unipole can go home because it's so powerful and secure that it doesn't have to sweat what's going on in the rest of the world. Just go home. You won. We won the Cold War. We're Godzilla. Let's go home. Who's going to threaten us? And if the minions want to fight among themselves, who cares? That's one possibility. Second is you can stay involved abroad and use the power you have to maintain the status quo. Or number three, you can stay involved abroad and use that power to do social engineering on a grand scale. That, number three, is what Uncle Sam did. Because Uncle Sam has this liberal impulse hardwired into it. And it, of course, has the capability in terms of raw power. And as I pointed out to you last time, social engineering is at the heart of modern liberalism. Modern liberalism is all about social engineering. And modern liberals have great confidence in social engineering. So when you put the distribution of power, this liberal DNA, which involves this universalist impulse in your belief in social engineering, you're off to the races. And that's exactly what happened after 1989. Talk a little bit about liberal hegemony in action. Uh, you get, as I just said, you get a super ambitious foreign policy. You also get a heavily militarized foreign policy. The United States is a militaristic state. Right? It's really quite remarkable. I'll talk more about this as we go along. We're addicted to war. Uh, and these are liberal-driven wars. I'll talk a little bit about this tomorrow. Me and my realist friends have been against almost every one of these wars. And it's my liberal friends who are pushing these wars. I have some liberal friends who have never seen a war they didn't want to fight. We have a highly militarized foreign policy. The United States has fought seven separate wars since the Cold War ended, and it's been at war for two out of every three years since 1989. This is remarkable. <laughs> Going back to Nuno's template, I thought we won the Cold War. We could go home and relax. We're so powerful. But no, 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 that's not what we did. And we did it for liberal reasons. Liberal hegemony action. Two cases. Let's talk a little bit about NATO expansion. Uh, as you know, when the Cold War ended, shortly thereafter, in the Clinton administration, they began to talk about expanding NATO. And as I'll make clear as we go along here, this is the, one of the principal causes of the conflict with Russia over Ukraine. Uh, the first expansion was in 1999. We brought in Poland, Hungary, and the Czech Republic. 
The second expansion was in 2004. We bought in the Baltic states, Romania, Slovenia, Slovakia, so forth and so on. Uh, and then after 2008, we were talking about bringing in Ukraine and Georgia. Uh, now, when things blew up after the February 22nd, 2014 coup in Ukraine, when things blew up between us and the Russians, they took Crimea, so forth and so on, everybody said the Russians are a threat to overrun Eastern Europe. The whole purpose of NATO expansion was to contain Russia and thank goodness we were actually moving further and further into Eastern Europe. That's simply not true. That's simply not true. There's no evidence to support that argument. We were moving NATO eastward in large part as an element in a liberal strategy that was designed to take this security community in the Deutschian sense of the term, that we had created in Western Europe during the Cold War and move it eastward. It included not only spreading NATO, it included spreading the European Union and promoting democracy. You all remember the Orange Revolution in Ukraine? And you remember the Rose Revolution in Georgia? This was all designed to take this security community and move it eastward. Michael McFall, who I've debated on this issue of the Ukraine crisis, who was the US ambassador to Russia from 2012 to right before the 2014 coup, says that I told Putin on numerous occasions and I told his lieutenants on numerous occasions that NATO expansion was not a threat to Russia. And he genuinely believed that. Barack Obama has said the same thing. He genuinely believed it. These people, who were pushing NATO expansion, did not believe in realpolitik and containment. In fact, they said that anyone who believes in realpolitik and containment, and that includes yours truly, is a 17th century person. That's right. We're dinosaurs. That world has gone away with the end of the Cold War. So NATO expansion was not motivated by realist logic. And by the way, virtually all the realists were opposed to NATO expansion and said, this is not going to have a happy ending. And George Kennan gave a famous interview to Thomas Friedman of the New York Times, who wrote it up. And Kennan said exactly that. This is unnecessary, and it's going to lead to big trouble. And surprise of surprises, it led to a war in August 2008 between Russia and Georgia. And in 2014, you ended up with a war between Russia and Ukraine over Ukraine. Right. But it was not driven by realist logic. Bush doctrine, you know, a lot of people will say, what's going on in the Middle East, or the greater Middle East, is that we are uh, pursuing the American national interest in a realpolitik kind of way and just disguising our behavior with liberal rhetoric. Uh, in fact, if you look at what the Bush administration said, that's not true. And as I explained to you about the Iraq case, we went into Iraq for the purpose of turning it into a liberal democracy because we saw that as part of a story where there would be no more war in the Middle East. Once we got beyond Iraq and we got Syria involved and Iran involved and we democratized the entire place, it would all lead to peace, love and dope, and it would take terrorism and nuclear proliferation off the table. That was the basic view here of what we were up to. Uh, of course, it all crashed and burned, but, uh, uh, but that was the initial intention. And by the way, it was a remarkably ambitious foreign policy. I can think of no case in American history where we pursued a foreign policy that was as ambitious and foolish as this. The idea that we were going to democratize the Middle East, a region of the world that had hardly any history of democracy, at the end of a rifle barrel, really remarkable. And of course, who opposed that war? Mainly realists. Some liberals did, much to their credit, but mainly realists. Why is liberal hegemony doomed? 
Reason number one, social engineering in foreign countries is an extremely difficult enterprise under the best of circumstances. Indeed, social engineering in one's own country is especially difficult. But the idea that we can go into a foreign country, we can go into a foreign country where most of the people don't speak the language, don't understand the culture, knock off the regime, right, and therefore create a lot of chaos, and then create order out of that chaos, and not just order out of that chaos, but create liberal democracy or even just democracy? This is a pipe dream. And using the U.S. military for that? I spent 10 years of my life in the U.S. military. I went to West Point. The U.S. military, the U.S. Army, these ground forces that we have, they're good at breaking things. They're good at killing people. They're giant killing machines. The idea that you could take the U.S. Army and send it into Iraq and that it is going to be able to do nation building or state building in a sophisticated way, it's not going to happen, I can guarantee you. You want to send him up against Saddam's army in the middle of the desert in 1991, right? You want to do that? That's Bambi versus Godzilla, right? That's what the U.S. Army or the U.S. Marines are good at doing, right? But you start talking about taking the American military, putting it in a place like Vietnam, putting it in a place like Afghanistan and letting it do social engineering, not going to work. Right? But I don't even care if you bring in experts, it's not going to work anyway. And if it does work, it's going to take you a heck of a long time. But there are three other reasons it's not going to work. <laughs> Second is, nationalism is a remarkably powerful force. You've heard me say that on more than one occasion between the last lecture and this one. And it causes the target state to resist foreign intervention. I won't go into a long song and dance about what nationalism is all about. I'd love to do that. But let me just say, self-determination and sovereignty are at the heart of nationalism. Right? The people in a nation state, the nation itself and the leaders who run a state, they want to determine for themselves uh, what their domestic politics look like, and they want to determine for themselves what their foreign policy looks like. Uh, this is what sovereignty is all about. Uh, and they don't want a foreign country, whether it's the United States or the Soviet Union going into Afghanistan or Britain going into Afghanistan or France going into Vietnam. These people don't want foreigners running their politics. They don't want foreigners occupying their country. And who can blame them? As I point out here, think about the U.S. outrage over claims that the Russians interfered in the 2016 election. Apparently, from reading the newspapers, this drives Americans crazy. The idea that the Russians interfered in our elections. Well, we interfere in elections all over the planet. We interfere in the politics of states all over the planet. We think we have a God-given right to go into any country, violent sovereignty if it's done for just purposes, which means promoting liberal democracy. We have a rich history of it, as you know. But as my mother taught me when I was a little boy, what's good for the goose is good for the gander. If, we want, if we're jealous gods when it comes to our sovereignty, don't you think that people in other countries are going to feel the same way? Don't you think the Vietnamese, after World War II, are going to want the French out? And then when the Americans replace the French, don't you think they're going to want us out? They are. You think the Afghanis are happy about us being there? You think that this is a long-term solution? Of course, you may believe we can do the necessary social engineering to fix the problem. Getting back to my first point, don't bet on it. You understand that Afghanistan is the longest war in American history, and we have now spent quite a bit more money on fixing Afghanistan than we spent with the Marshall Plan. And look at the results, not pretty. Reason number three, individual rights, this whole concept of inalienable rights are oversold. If you uh, uh, sort of look around the world at surveys and you look at a number of historical cases, what you see is that people generally think rights are important, but they don't privilege them to the extent that the theory says they should. And people will often sacrifice rights for stability. 
there's a lot of survey data that shows that this is true today in the Middle East. Hardly surprising. If you lived in one of those countries would you, that the United States has helped wreck, would you be interested first and foremost in creating liberal democracy or would you be interested first and foremost in creating some stability? I think the answer is quite clear. Go to Russia today. Right? First time I ever went to Russia, I talked to all sorts of people about this issue. How do you think about liberal democracy? Liberal democracy means one thing to them, the 1990s. Tried that, been there, and it was a total disaster. Thank God we have Putin. If he's not a liberal Democrat, and he is a semi-authoritarian leader, more power to him. That's the answer you hear most of the time. Can you blame them? But what this means is that liberal democracy is not always an easy sell. It's not like you're going abroad and everybody's out there just demanding liberal democracy. Oh my God, this is the most important political system in the world, and if we can just get it, we'll live happily ever after. This is not to say that there aren't many places where they would prefer liberal democracy over some semi-authoritarian system. There are cases like that. But the point is, it's not an easy sell. And then finally, some states actually act to balance against the unipol. They act according to realist logic. This certainly has been true with China and Russia, and also with Iran and North Korea. I'm going to talk a little bit more about NATO expansion in a second. The Russians view NATO expansion from a purely realpolitik point of view. Right? This is balanced power politics. The idea that the United States can take a military alliance that was a mortal enemy of the Soviet Union and march it up to Russia's doorstep and make Ukraine and Georgia part of the West, it's not going to happen. They'll tell you that. It is not going to happen for balance of power reasons. And all you have to do is talk about the Chinese, about the presence of the American military in East Asia. It bothers them greatly. They do not like the idea of us being on their doorstep. And they'll tell you behind closed doors they intend to push us eventually out beyond the first island chain and then out beyond the second island chain. And I don't blame them one bit, but I'm just telling you, if you're interested in selling liberal hegemony to major powers in the system like Russia and China, you ought to understand that there are real limits to what you can do. And then, of course, you have minor powers like Iran and North Korea. Look at what North Korea is doing today. People say, oh, what North Korea is doing today is crazy. They're irrational. Kim Jong-un, we've never seen anybody this crazy. The thought of him having nuclear weapons is horrifying. I'd make a case that what Kim Jong-un is doing is very reasonable. If I were Kim Jong-un, I'd have nuclear weapons, and I'd never, ever get rid of them. Never. Why? Because the United States is running around the world knocking off regimes. That's what liberal hegemony is all about. That means if you're not a liberal hegemonic state, Think about what Michael Doyle said. You could be in the crosshairs. And how do you prevent regime change? The best way to do it is have nuclear weapons. We don't like that for understandable reasons. But from their point of view, it makes eminently good sense. Iran, I've said in public on a number of occasions, if I was the Iranian National Security Advisor, they'd already have nuclear weapons. And I can guarantee you that if they had nuclear weapons, the Americans and the Israelis would not be threatening them. Very simple. But the point that I'm trying to make to you here is that some states resist. Not all of them, but some. Some are foolish, like Colonel Gaddafi. We promised Colonel Gaddafi that if he gave up his WMD programs, we'd leave him alone. You know where he is now. He's six feet under. Right? Six feet under. Very foolish. <laughs> bottom line here, <laughs> bottom line here is if you can balance, balance. And some figure that out. So anyway, my basic argument is that liberal hegemony is doomed because social engineering is wickedly difficult. Nationalism causes significant resistance. Individuals right, individual rights matter, but not that much. And it should be number four, realism remains a key factor for some states. Some states. Talk a little bit about the Ukraine crisis. Uh, as I said to you before, NATO expansion, EU expansion, and spreading democracy were all about, uh, all, all about enlarging the security community that existed in Western Europe. And, and there was even thoughts of eventually bringing the Russians in. It was not balance of power politics. 
But what happened is that after the April 2008 NATO summit in Bucharest, where we said that Georgia and Ukraine would become part of NATO, you had shortly thereafter in August 2008 a war over Georgia, and then in 2014 you had the war over Ukraine. Remember, 2008, April 2008. Look at the communique that was issued after the Bucharest NATO summit. It said that Georgia and Ukraine will become part of NATO. And you had wars involving both of those countries. And the Russians have no intention of letting either Georgia or Ukraine become part of the West. They'll wreck both those countries before they let it happen. This is basic geopolitics. And what's happened to Putin? Putin's standing has gone up significantly. Why? Basic nationalism. Nationalism at home. Factors driving the Russian behavior. Realism 101, nationalism, and stability over rights. That's the Russian story. That's why it's so hard to sell liberal democracy in Russia, the last consideration, and why the Ukraine crisis happened, first point. And second point about nationalism is why Putin is so popular. Talk a little bit about the Bush doctrine. There are five countries that were the main targets of regime change. We actually used military force in Afghanistan, Iraq, and Libya. In the case of Syria, we provided huge amounts of money and training to the rebels. We were deeply committed to overthrowing the government in Damascus, the Assad government. If you read the newspapers in the United States, what you see is people constantly beating Barack Obama and Hillary Clinton over the head for not doing anything to get rid of the regime in Damascus. This is simply wrong. We did not intervene with our own military forces in any meaningful way, but we were behind. We were behind the insurgency in a major way. We were deeply committed to regime change in Syria. And we were also involved in regime change in Egypt. We helped get rid of Mubarak, and then when the Muslim Brotherhood won a democratic election, we helped usher that leader, Mohamed Morsi, out of power when the Egyptian people and the United States became disenchanted with Morsi. But if you just sort of look at those five cases, Afghanistan is a disaster zone, Iraq, another disaster zone, Libya, another disaster zone, Syria, another disaster zone. And although we had a brief interregnum where we had liberal democracy or democracy in Egypt, that lasted about a year. And now we're back to where we have a thug in power who we're comfortable supporting. Okay. This is an abysmal track record. Just think of all the death and destruction in the Middle East since 2001. It's really stunning, really stunning. This is all, in my opinion, this is all due to local factors plus, in a really big way, liberal hegemony. The United States has played a key role in almost all of those cases. Egypt is the only possible exception in causing a huge amount of murder and mayhem. Right? Local factors mattered. I don't deny that. But the United States played an enormously important role. Bush Doctrine, why did it fail? Difficulty of doing social engineering. Social engineering in Iraq, social engineering in Afghanistan, good luck. So I think I said in the Q&A period last time, when the Soviets invaded Afghanistan in 1979, virtually all of my colleagues in the national security community were aghast. They said, oh my god, the Soviets are on the march. This is terrible. Right? We've been weak in the 1970s, dot, dot, dot. My view was exactly the opposite. The Soviets invading Afghanistan was the best news the United States could have had. They just jumped into a giant quagmire. It's like us going into Vietnam. When I used to go to China in the early 2000s, I used to tell the Chinese, what you really want to do is tell the Americans that they have to win the war on terror. You're counting on them to win the war on terror. 
and they have to stay in Afghanistan and Iraq till they win the war on terror, right? That'll be forever, right? And meanwhile, you sit on the sidelines and just continue to get richer and richer. The last thing you want to do if you're China is end up in Vietnam or Afghanistan or Iraq. These are places you want to stay out of for the reasons I said. Difficulty of doing social engineering, nationalism, and the fact that most people, certainly at this point in time, privilege stability over rights. Bottom line, liberal hegemony leads to one failure after another. And this is one of the reasons, ladies and gentlemen, that Donald Trump is president of the United States. He explicitly challenged almost every aspect of liberal hegemony during the 2016 campaign. Almost every aspect. How it all turns out with him, I don't know. But there's a great deal of disenchantment in the body populace in this country. The elites, as I told you, they love liberal hegemony. But the body politic, not so clear. A lot of disenchantment. And I believe that this contributed. I don't think it was the main reason by any means. But I think this contributed to the election of Donald Trump. Let me conclude with one final point, which I think is of great significance. I think that liberal hegemony undermines liberalism at home. It threatens core American values. Because America becomes a militarized state. You get this huge national security state. And especially when you're fighting a global war on terror and you think you definitely have to monitor what people in the society are doing. You have to turn the National Security Agency loose to monitors people's, monitor people's emails and telephone conversations and so forth and so on. Right. Uh, so I think that uh, as founding fathers understood, James Madison in particular, no nation can preserve its freedom in the midst of continual warfare. And we live in a country that's engaged in continual warfare. And it's engaged in continual warfare because we have decided to pursue a policy of liberal hegemony. And that was not necessary. As Nuno said, when you're in unipolarity, you have three choices, three very different choices, three stark choices. And we decided to do massive social engineering at the end of a rifle barrel. We tried to create a planet that's filled with liberal democracies. And it failed. And that's where we are today. Thank you. Yeah. I'll be happy to take questions. Uh, sir. Please tell me, Professor, how you overcame the temptation to become a member of the State Department. <laughs> His question was, how did I overcome the temptation to become a member of the State Department? Right. It was very simple. It's the way I'm constitutionally wired. I hate authority. <laughs> it's why I love being an academic. As some of you have heard me say, I went to West Point as an undergraduate, and I really hated it. Uh, I'm very thankful I went there because I learned all sorts of important lessons. But I always tell people that I actually hated going to West Point, and I hated the military because I hate guns, I hate sleeping in the woods, I hate shaving, um, I hate uniforms, but most importantly, I hate authority. Uh, so academia was the ideal place for me, and there was no hope that I could function in a meaningful way in the State Department, because I'd have to take orders from somebody. Yeah, his, his question is, could I say something about the role of religion? I downplay religion in my story, obviously, which is what uh, prompted your question. If I were to talk about religion, I would embed it in the discussion of nationalism, okay? And my argument is that when you begin to sort of unpack the concept of nationalism and get it its essence, you have to talk about culture, right? All, all these nations have particular cultures, 
And cultures are all about different practices and beliefs, okay? So one set of beliefs that you can have involve religion. Sam Huntington has written a book called Who Are We? that argues that the United States at its root is a white Anglo-Saxon Protestant country. And that has not changed in any fundamental way. And he's talking about nationalism, and he's taking that argument about Protestantism, and he is integrating it into nationalism. Right? If you were to look at a country like Iran, it's obvious that when you talk about Iranian nationalism, you have to incorporate religion into it, okay? Now, I think where the real conflict comes up, the intellectual conflict comes up on this issue, is that there are a lot of people who believe that religion uh, transcends boundaries and matters in very important ways. So, to go to another book that Sam Huntington wrote, which is The Clash of Civilizations, right? When he talked about Islam versus Christianity, right? This Western civilization that, where Christianity really matters and this Islamic civilization, religion is of great importance, right? And the fault lines in his story in that book involve religion. I don't think that theory of his explains how the world works hardly at all. Because I view the world as based on a system of nation states. I made this point to you folks in the previous lecture. If you look at the planet, looks differently. You look at Western Europe, or you look at Europe in 1450, right? Look at a map of Europe in 1450. There are douches, principalities, empires, city-states a wide assortment of different kinds of political orders. There are no states. Today, if you look at the entire planet, it's populated by nothing but nation states. Nothing but nation states. Nationalism is an incredibly powerful force. So I subordinate religion to nationalism, right? And when I hear, you know, uh, about how in the Middle East we have this Islamic force that's arrayed against us, you know, I say, we went in to rescue Kuwait, which was an Islamic country that was invaded by Iraq, which is an Islamic country. Between 1980 and 1988, Iran and Iraq fought this incredibly bloody war. Saudi Arabia and Iran today are both Islamic countries. Now you could say it's Shia versus Sunni. Final point to you is you should look at the literature on the Thirty Years' War. 1618 to 1648, there's a book out from Harvard University Press by Peter Wilson, very interesting book. And the question you should ask yourself when you read the book is how much of the Thirty Years' War, which is, you know, in the aftermath of the Reformation and where you would expect religion to really matter big time, how much of the conflict is driven by religion and how much of it is driven by basic balance of power politics? It's actually surprising how little religion mattered, in my opinion. I don't want to be so foolish as to say religion didn't matter at all. And in fact, this is a case where if religion was going to matter, this is the place you would expect it to matter, right? But in fact, religion oftentimes in the story gets subordinated to just good old-fashioned balance of power politics. So all this is to say I kind of downplay the importance of religion. Okay, l let me repeat your question for everybody, and you correct me or fill in the blanks if I don't exactly re uh, represent your question. He he's basically challenging me uh, on the point 
that uh, NATO expansion caused the Russian reaction over Georgia and over Ukraine. And he's saying that there's evidence before 2008, which is the key point that we both agree on. Before 2008, there was evidence of Russian aggression. He said, for example, uh, there's the case of Chechnya, right? And he said uh, there's evidence that uh, the Russians had plans to invade Crimea and Ukraine uh, before the 2008 crisis. And Georgia. and Georgia, before the 2008 crisis, okay? Uh, I disagree with you, and, and here's why. First of all, Chechnya is inside Russia. It's not outside. So uh, that's not evidence of aggression. Secondly, I've spent an enormous amount of time trying to find evidence that the Russians had contingency plans for taking Crimea before February 22nd, 2014. I can find no evidence. Yes, but we're talking about after 1990. I just, I think there's no evidence uh, of Russian aggression. And, and just, if you look at the deployment of Russian forces in the western districts of Russia, there are hardly any military forces there in February of 2014. And in fact, if you look at the Russian case, and, and, and by the way, if you go to Russia today, you'll find the same thing. The Russians do not want an arms race with the West. They do not want an arms race with the United States. And they don't want an arms race with the United States because they understand that what got the Soviet Union into trouble was that the Soviet Union spent much too much money on defense and not enough money on refurbishing the economy. And this is a country that is in economic trouble. It's a giant gas station. They understand that they have to modernize the, arm, uh, modernize the economy, and that involves spending lots of money. And you can't do that if you're fighting wars with the West. Furthermore, I believe the Russians, especially Putin, are very sophisticated uh, strategists. And they understand full well that the last thing they want to do is invade a country in Eastern Europe and occupy it. Right? It would be the height of foolishness. Right? I often say to people, if you really want to wreck Russia, what you ought to do is encourage them to invade a couple countries in Eastern Europe. Let's see how that works out. Not very well. Or if you don't like that, you can have them invade Afghanistan again. They can go in and take over for us, right? I think the Russians understand this, that, that expansion, this is, this is the power of nationalism. You know, I've made the argument on a number of occasions, the two principal blocks against military aggression today are number one, nuclear weapons, and number two, nationalism. Nationalism makes it very hard to conquer countries, especially if you have to occupy them. And I think the Russians fully understand this. I'll just say one final point on this. Russia is a declining great power, largely for demographic reasons, but also for economic reasons. Just look at the demographic, the projected demographic curves out to 2050. They had big trouble, big trouble on the horizon. Uh, sir. Three. <laughs> I thought you said you agreed with most of what I said. So I think we have like different understandings of liberal hegemony. I think what you are basically saying is that it's all about military intervention in foreign countries. But I would rather say it's more about values and norms. And a liberal order 
challenge your understanding of liberal hegemony. I, I think it's it's more it's more suitable to talk about imperialism when we talk about intervention. Uh, and secondly, you, you said that net nationalism is is a great resistance to the liberal hegemony because it's all about self determination and sovereignty. But we've seen that national states such as Russia themselves do not uh, care a lot about self determination and sovereignty of other countries. So, for example, we could see NATO NATO expansion eastwards. We could see it as an expansion, but we also can look at it that it is sovereign decisions yeah. by the states as Poland, as the Czech Republic, and so on, who had a past with Soviet uh, aggression to decide on their own. Okay, you, got, you have to be shorter. I, yeah, to become member. I'll take your second point, just quickly. Yeah. My argument, which I did not expound on just because of time, is that states care greatly about their own sovereignty. But great powers especially violate the sovereignty of other countries all the time. That's okay. not a characteristic of liberal hegemony. Pardon? It's not, uh, it's not, the, it's not, the only, it's not only liberal hegemony that behaves that way. That, that may be true, but nevertheless, if you're going to pursue a policy of liberal hegemony, you want to understand that when you invade other countries, you're going to bump up against nationalism. That was my point. But you're absolutely right. I mean, we went into Vietnam, a remarkably foolish decision, right, because we believed in the domino theory, which is a sort of a misguided realist view of the world. Uh, we didn't go in there for purposes of promoting liberal democracy, but still it happened there. What was your first point again? Um, about values. A narrow understanding of liberal hegemony, just, yeah, just I, basically about interventions and not about like putting up international institutions okay. that well, I think the most powerful point you made that's the most difficult for me to deal with is your point that we actually uh, made liberal democracy work in West Germany during the Cold War. And again, as I said in the talk, we created this zone of liberal democracies in Western Europe. Uh, and then your other point was South Korea. We're eventually in South Korea. It took quite a while. Uh, we got a liberal democracy. I just make a couple points just to stick to Western Europe. First of all, we were an occupier in Western Europe, especially in Germany, but we were an occupier in large part because there was this thing there called the Soviet threat that the West Europeans feared greatly, the Americans feared greatly, and the West Europeans wanted us there to protect them. That's point number one. Point number two is just to take Germany. Germany actually had a rich history of democracy, right? Weimar Germany was a liberal democracy. And there is a whole literature that argues that Germany was a democracy, a liberal democracy, before World War I. Now, that's a disputed claim, but there are people who make that argument. So it was not that difficult, given that Germany had been destroyed, number one, given the fact that Germany needed us to protect them against the Soviet Union, or at least they thought they did. And number three, that they had a history of democracy for us to make it work there. Right? So there are circumstances where it can be made to work. Very unusual circumstances. But what happens in the cases that we're talking about is you get the United States invading countries that have hardly any history of democracy, don't face external threats except from us, Right, and uh, it therefore becomes very difficult. Yes? Um, yeah, uh, in countries that are lacking in the, the history of liberal democratic history and where there's a really high level of internecine violence, uh, Iraq, Syria, maybe to a lesser extent Burma these days, what would your theory say about whether it would be better or worse for those countries to maintain their territorial integrity or to split apart? Um, uh, yeah. I, I don't have anything to say about that in my theories, so to speak. Um, I mean, I have views on those subjects. Uh, but there's no kind of uh, overarching theoretical thought about whether that violence is better contained within a nation state or kind of between nation states. No, I mean, not, not as part of the argument that I'm making up here. 
I mean, I, I had all sorts of views and wrote about this in the 1990s with regard to Yugoslavia, but we'd really get off the trail if I started talking about that. And I'm not sure I could remember everything I said at the time. <laughs> Sir. Uh, yes, uh, I, I really appreciated what you said about Germany. Uh, how would you, though, m make, ha is it possible to make the same argument with respect to Japan after World War II or, or I mean, similarly, were, was the United States then looking at the China threat? Or how, how do you, uh, how, how do you uh, think about that? Well, uh, the Japanese case is similar to the German case. First of all, Japan was destroyed, much the way Germany was destroyed. One cannot underestimate the extent to which these two countries were destroyed. Uh, you know, in, in the Japanese case, we're firebombing Japanese cities starting on March 10th, 1945. And uh, we killed more people the first night we firebombed Tokyo than were killed at either Hiroshima or Nagasaki. We were burning Japanese cities to the ground uh, at an incredibly rapid pace. Uh, and, uh, and then we dropped two nuclear weapons on them. And uh, there were very few Japanese cities left that, uh, uh, that weren't wrecked. And, uh, uh, and they had suffered a devastating defeat in the war. Lots of Japanese had died. Uh, so. This was a wrecked country. And they did believe they, too, faced the Soviet threat. And you want to remember that in those days, people believed when North Korea invaded South Korea on June 25th, 1950, that North Korea was a Soviet proxy. And people believed in the domino theory, foolish as it was. And the Japanese, therefore, were very nervous. And of course, they were very nervous about the Chinese as well, because the Chinese and the North Koreans and the Soviets and the North Vietnamese were all seen as part of a seamless web. These were people who did not appreciate the importance of nationalism, OK? And uh, so they had that. But also, Japan did have a period where it was a liberal democracy. Uh, and uh, that was mainly in the 1920s. Uh, I don't think it was as progressive as Germany was, Weimar Germany, but nevertheless, I think the basic ingredients were there. The other case that's raised, by the way, uh, against me sometimes are, are the uh, Eastern European revolutions in 1989, right? Because there you got democracy. And the, argu I mean, the argument that people like me make is that that was from the bottom up. What happened in 1989 was not a case of the United States causing regime change and helping to create a liberal democracy. It was the collapse of the Soviet Union and the evacuation of Soviet forces, and in a very important way, the return of sovereignty to those countries where there were powerful democratic or liberal democratic forces down below that bubbled up. Uh, because I remember in the context of the Iraq war, uh, opponents of that war, like myself, argued that things would go south, as I believe they did. And many of the proponents of the war, this is the Iraq War in 2003, would argue that the experience of the various countries in Eastern Europe showed that once you got rid of a dictator, right, once you got rid of an authoritarian leader, that democracy would bubble up from the bottom. And of course, that did happen in Eastern Europe, but we didn't do it. And, uh, and, and the situation in the Middle East was fundamentally different. Yes, ma'am. Could I answer your first question first, just because I'll forget it? <laughs> but I'll answer your second question, too. Yeah, and, and the second, it actually wasn't a question. It was a challenge to something you said earlier. Was um, it the first? <laughs> 
<laughs> Go ahead. Go ahead. You can ask both of them. In your slide about Donald Trump's election, you gave a lot of credence to this idea of American spreading of left world hegemony being the explanation for why he had such popular support. But that seems to ignore a lot of what was happening domestically. So either Donald Trump is a genius and he was able to figure all of this out and then get elected based on that, or there's more in terms of what was happening at home and again people's preferences for the future of their country. So I'd be curious to hear thoughts on both of those. Just on the second part, I, I think what was going on at home was more important than foreign policy. I, I didn't mean to oversell foreign policy. I thought I used qualifying language. I was not arguing that um, the principal reason he got elected was that he opposed liberal hegemony. Uh, I, I just said it contributed. Uh, I think your description is on the money, that it was mainly domestic politics. Uh, the fact that there's a large amount of resentment in this country involving jobs and income and so forth and so on, those kinds of things I think really mattered more. But I was just saying this contributed to it. Uh, and your first question is, where do people fit in? And I, I think you said, where do people's preferences fit in, especially preferences for democracy? Uh, well, first of all, I think people are a big part of my story when it comes to nationalism, right, uh, for sure. And uh, uh, I understand your point about preferences. And I, I think if, uh, if people in a particular country want to become democratic, uh, that's wonderful. Uh, as I said in the first lecture, uh, my views on liberal democracy at home are fundamentally different than my views on liberal democracy abroad. I thank my lucky stars. I was born in the United States, which is a liberal democracy, and I think all things considered, I prefer to live in a liberal democracy than any other form of political system, any other kind of political system. But my argument is when you take it abroad, it leads to all sorts of problems. I tend to favor self-determination. And I believe that if people want to become democratic, that's up to them, right? And it's not our business to go in and influence things one way or the other. And I think you end up getting into lots of trouble. Now, some people might say, you might say, that John, you can do this in a sophisticated way. The problem is that we've behaved in blunderpuss fashion in the past. Let's do it in a sophisticated way. Let's pay attention to the preferences of people in other countries and so forth and so on. I kind of understand that argument, but I think you then run into what I call the slippery slope problem, that once you get in the business of trying to promote democracy in other countries, and you're as powerful as the United States, and you're as confident as people in the United States are about your ability to do social engineering, you're off to the races. And I don't like that at all. So for purposes of promoting democracy, my way of doing it would be to be the city on the hill. And to tie that into my last point, the argument I was making is that it's hard to be the city on the hill when you're intervening all over the planet in a militarized fashion because you're undermining liberalism at home. And I am, I'm actually a huge civil libertarian. I'm, uh, and I think civil liberties matter enormously. And uh, I think the idea of having a national security state is frightening. Uh, you go to Washington these days, it is a national security state. We're addicted to war. And again, I'm not against having a military. I went to West Point. I was in the military for 10 years of my life. I understand you need a military. But I think you have to be very, very careful uh, not to uh, turn the United States into a militaristic state. And I think when you pursue your more sophisticated defense of liberal hegemony or promoting liberal democracy around the world, you quickly run into the slippery slope problem. That would sort of be my argument. I think we have time for one more question. Sir. Back to the sphere of influences and not uh, mingle with other countries. 
Did, did everybody hear his question? Uh, his view is basically that I have a more or less reactionary view and that what I'm talking about in, in, in defending the Russians is basically arguing that we should go back to uh, a sphere of influences view of the world. And I interpret, and I don't think you would have any trouble with this, I, I interpret a sphere of influences type of the world to be basic balance of power politics, right? They, they go together, right? Uh, now, I believe that you can't go back to balance of power politics because we never left them behind, right? <laughs> this, is what, this is what we forgot when we moved NATO eastward. Balance of power politics was alive and well. Not in the United States, but in Russia. And it's true in China. And it's true in Iran. And it's true in South Korea. Right? So the idea that this is old think, I mean, I think this is the way most Americans think. Your view is what I would call the, today the sort of typical American view of international politics. We have transcended spheres of influence. Right? We live in a different world. And I, I don't believe that for one second. I believe balance of power politics is alive and well. And this is why we got ourselves in so much trouble on Russia. Now, I just want to unpack this a bit more. Talk about the rise of China. Okay? If China continues to rise and Russia continues to come back from the dead, we move from unipolarity to multipolarity, or if you want to excise the Russians and just talk about the Chinese and the Americans, you move back to bipolarity, okay? Now remember what I said in the presentation. If you're in a bipolar world or you're in a multipolar world, you cannot pursue liberal hegemony, right? So my argument is that if China continues to rise, the United States will engage in an intense security competition with China where balance of power politics and spheres of influence matter greatly. And if you go to China today and you talk to the Chinese about the South China Sea and the East China Sea, and you talk about the American military presence in those areas, they do not like it because they view those areas as their sphere of influence. They understand that we got in there when China was weak, but they'd like to get us out. And I would argue that what you'll see with the United States is that the United States will think in terms of spheres of influence. You, you know what the Monroe Doctrine is, right? The Monroe Doctrine basically says that the United States owns the Western Hemisphere and no distant great power, be it from Europe or be it from Asia, is allowed to move military forces into the Western Hemisphere and form a military alliance with a country in our hemisphere. The Monroe Doctrine, which has not gone away, right? the Monroe Doctrine is all about spheres of influence. It says the Western Hemisphere is our sphere of influence. Do you think in 25 years, if China decides to form a military alliance with Canada or Mexico and station a couple Chinese divisions in Vancouver and Toronto that we're not going to go ballistic? <laughs> You're a young guy, so you probably don't remember the Cuban Missile Crisis. Unfortunately, I'm not a young guy, and I remember the Cuban Missile Crisis. The idea that the Soviets were putting missiles in Cuba was completely antithetical to us. And then when they talked about building a naval base at Cienfuegos, we almost blew another gasket. The Soviets are not allowed in the Western Hemisphere. Why? Because it's an American sphere of influence. Why? Because it's our backyard. Well, if you're Vladimir Putin or any Russian leader, the idea that NATO is going to be allowed to drive right up to your border, it's just not going to happen. It's just not going to happen. And you know, people will say, well, John, don't you understand that the Ukrainians are free to choose their own foreign policy? You often hear this argument. We were talking about this yesterday. 
the Ukrainians are free to choose their own foreign policy. They're a sovereign state. This is not a decision the Russians can make for them. My view is that's a very dangerous way of thinking about international politics. Ukraine is not a sovereign state when it comes to this issue. The Russians are not going to tolerate them forming an alliance with NATO. Right? And if Ukraine behaves like it is a sovereign state, right, it's going to get itself into a whale of a lot of trouble. This is what happened to Castro. Do you think the United States believed during the Cold War, and even after the Cold War, that Cuba had the right as a sovereign state to form an alliance with any state that it chose to? We didn't think that for one second. We did not think that for one second. And we went to great lengths to kill Castro and to strangle Cuba because Castro thought that he, like the Ukrainians thought, had the right to form an alliance with just any state. When you're dealing with great powers, and this is another lecture, great powers are ruthless. The United States is one of the most ruthless great powers in modern history. You cannot underestimate how ruthless the United States is. This is all covered up in the textbooks and the classes uh, that we take growing up, right? Because this is all part of nationalism. Nationalism is all about creating myths about how wonderful your country is.